Hello everyone, my name is Inigo. This is my first video solo and I have been invited to talk to uh, many podcasts about multiple issues. And the main reason I'm shooting this video is because I get contacted um, by people from, from around the world every day asking questions about metabolic health, uh, mitochondrial function, exercise, performance, type 2 diabetes, cancer metabolism, longevity, and I simply cannot answer everyone. So I decided to um, shoot a video like this and hopefully I can shoot more. And I'm going to start today by explaining training zones and how I define them and how I prescribe them to uh, both athletes as well as populations with chronic diseases. So this is not a zone two video, please. Uh, it is a video about how I define different training zones and how I started doing this almost 30 years ago. So um, about that, oh, about 30 years ago, I was transitioning from being uh, um, a competitive athlete to start working with competitive athletes. And I was always, of course, very curious about human performance and human metabolism and how to improve it. And, and I was not quite satisfied as an athlete with the information that it was out there on how to train and especially training zones. Um, uh, one thing that it was very common back in the days is that long... Uh, Riot uh, or, or long days, endurance, aerobic, uh, which obviously it, it isn't something that now is it's important, but it has been there from the beginning of times, like, right? The endurance, long aerobic rides. Uh, but that those terminologies were quite vague. People would tell, yeah, you have to train between 130 and 140, or between 120 and 160 or about 65% of your view to max, or 75%. So there are many different uh, terminologies, but quite general and quite vague. So that's when, when I, was, I was not quite satisfied by that. And, and that's when I started working with athletes. I wanted to define those terminologies. And I wanted to define some training zones, and especially what each training zone represents. So uh, I started to build my terminology from zone one to zone six. And then I started to define uh, what each zone uh, metabolically represented and especially which energy system you're trying to target when you prescribe one specific training zones. So for that, I needed to first uh, establish a, 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 an important database measuring metabolic parameters during exercise. And I was fortunate to start working at a laboratory, at an exercise physiology laboratory, which I was running and then I was seeing athletes from all kinds of sports. Uh, so I was very fortunate to develop an, an immense uh, a database from so many athletes in so many sports and also uh, be able to look at the metabolic responses to exercise at a wide range of exercise intensities. For that, I used uh, metabolic cards, looking at VO2 max and lactate in the laboratory. I also started doing this also in the field, uh, especially with lactate. And about 18 years ago, I incorporated uh, substrate utilization, that is looking at uh, how many grams per minute of fat and carbohydrate you're oxidizing or burning. And that really opened up even more my eyes about how to better define and prescribe training zones uh, based on so also on substrate utilization, uh, which represented the metabolic stress of each training zone. Then <clears throat> I started to use both substrate utilization with lactate and uh, I started to then define this better and lately uh, at the university uh, I've been doing also muscle biopsies where we were looking at mitochondrial respiration where we would isolate um, mitochondria from muscle biopsies and, and as in the picture shows we would use different substrates to see in, in vivo how mitochondria would be working. Um, so with all that I, I, I was able to to gain a lot of knowledge about um, uh, what are the bioenergetics of exercise and what is the what, what, when we talk about a training zone what are you stimulating what is the energy system that you stimulate and that's how I start to create my zones from zone 1 to zone 6 so I will go ahead and, 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 and start in the, how I see it so as you see in the picture here uh, this is how what I call the metabolic map and this is what I've been using it for, I've been using for years. And then we can establish uh, even muscle fiber recruitment patterns, which are even more uh, helpful to define training zones. So uh, we have two types of muscle fibers, slow twitch muscle fibers and fast twitch muscle fibers. 
So the fast twitch muscle fibers are divided in type 2 A's and type 2 B's or X. So the graph shows here, let's look at it as a continuum right, of the exercise through multiple intensities. And we're going to start here from like very low intensity all the way to maximal intensity as you see in the graph here. So at very low intensity, you don't need to synthesize much ATP energy uh, for muscle contraction. Therefore, uh, you don't use a lot of fuel. So you use a little bit of fat, you use a little bit of glucose, and uh, you produce a little bit of lactate only. Right? That, 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 those muscle fibers, they're not very stressed, metabolically speaking. And this is what we use with athletes uh, to re for recovery days. So um, then as exercise intensity increases, we need to um, uh, synthesize ATP faster and more. And therefore, we need to start mobilizing different fuels and more fuels. So uh, we mobilize more fat, we mobilize more carbohydrates, and we start producing a little bit of lactate more. Um, one thing I like to talk also briefly or discuss briefly is like there's like a, that misconception that at low exercise intensities, you don't burn carbohydrates or glucose. That's not true. As we can see here, perfectly well, we can see in the laboratory too, even at low exercise intensities, you burn glucose. In fact, you burn always more glucose than fat, but it's at these intensities where you burn the most fat, okay? And fat can only be burned in mitochondria or oxidized. And this is why these muscle fibers, slow twitch muscle fibers, they have the highest mitochondrial content uh, because that, that's where you burn the most fat. So as exercise intensity increases, we start uh, using more and more and more fat and it gets to a point where you get to your maximal fat oxidation or utilization, which is kind of what we can call the fat max concept. That's the exercise intensity, you add the one you burn the most fat. You can translate it, as you can see in the graph here, into heart rate, into power output, uh, into pace, uh, speed, etc. right? What we see here is like you start accumulating a little bit of lactate. And this is uh, what I call the zone two. And I call this one too uh, because this is right before you start switching to the fast twitch muscle fibers. And the reason why you switch to the fast twitch muscle fibers is mainly because of the, of the fuel that you start needing. So as exercise intensity increases, you need more ATP. And fat is not fast enough to provide ATP. Those intensities where you recruit fast twitch muscle fibers, you start recruiting faster twitch muscle fibers, and therefore you need higher ATP synthesis. Therefore, um, fat starting to be not fast enough to provide ATP. And this is what we see in the graph here. There, there's like a big drop of fat um, um, a contribution for en to energy purposes. And there's like a, an increase in uh, carbohydrate oxidation utilization, right? So this is what I call the zone three. It's a transition zone between um, when you're burning the most fat until you're going to be relying uh, solely on carbohydrates. And this is when we go to the next zone. In the next zone, which is zone four, as we see in the graph here, there's a complete drop of fat uh, burning. There's no fat utilized anymore. And you see a, there's a big raise in carbohydrate utilization. Um, this is because at those intensities, um, the exercise is, is very intense and then you need to synthesize ATP very fast. And in order to achieve that, you need a lot of glucose. Fat is not fast enough anymore and it's not required anymore because it cannot provide energy fast enough. So that's when you see the big drop of fat. And uh, there's a lot of glucose that is utilized and this is usually a very high intensity. Some people call it uh, lactate threshold, other people can call it maximal lactate steady state, FTP, but this is an intensity that you can sustain for about 15 to 20, maybe 30 minutes. And this is what we call very glycolytic because you use a lot of glucose. Now, as you can see in the graph here as well, that's when you start seeing the lactate. Uh, it starts increasing also quite a bit. And the main reason is because you start using a lot of glucose and uh, the, um, the byproduct, the mandatory byproduct of glucose utilization always is lactate production. So lactate and, and carbohydrates or lactate and glucose, they go together as you can see in the graph. But it takes to a moment, it gets to a point where uh, lactate builds up 
and, and lactate can only be oxidized in mitochondria. And the preferred pathway for lactate to be oxidized, to be burnt or cleared, is um, our mitochondria of um, the adjacent slow twitch muscle fibers. So when um, mitochondria and slow twitch muscle fibers get saturated, they cannot um, clear lactate fast enough. So lactate starts building up in the muscles and um, then the, the, the only route for lactate is to escape to the bloodstream. And this is why we start seeing an increase in lactate in, 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 in the blood. And this is when we use this lactate testing, that's what we see. We look at lactate testing in your blood and we can see there's a high levels. And that, that's an indicator that your mitochondria in your slow twitch muscle fibers are saturated. Therefore, they cannot be oxidized and it's been building up and the only path way for that lactate is to be released uh, um, to the circulation to the bloodstream so this is what i call the zone four then you get um, uh, another exercise intensity which is uh, what we could call the vo2 max this is the intensity where you uh, get to the maximal aerobic capacity it's very high effort uh, and and obviously fat is not used anymore also and uh, uh, there's a lot more uh, utilization of carbohydrates and, and, and a very large production of, of lactate and a large, large buildup of lactate as well. That's what lactate levels increase a lot in the bloodstream as well. So, and this is when we reach the VO2 max. And, and this is, these are intensities usually sustainable for, for maybe two, three minutes, something like that, four minutes, super high intensities. And uh, this is what I call the zone five. That's when we move to zone six. So zone six is the, the last zone in my nomenclature. There are other ones out there, of course, but um, that's what I call the anaerobic because this is uh, the, the one zone where you passed that VO2 max, the maximal aerobic capacity. And now you're entering uh, at a situation where even ATP uh, cannot rely on glucose. Uh, it needs to it's so fast that the, the, the need of ATP, the demand of ATP, that uh, the muscles utilize the ATP that is stored in the muscles. And therefore, you don't rely on oxygen. So uh, it's what we use when we sprint or we do super high efforts uh, for maybe 20, 30 seconds. So again, it's usually like sprinting type of exercise. So this is like in a nutshell how I define training zones. And what I want to emphasize is that zone two is not everything. I see that zone two is it's an important zone to improve mitochondrial function. And uh, I see this because uh, this is where you improve lactate clearance capacity the most, as well as fat oxidation. And I see this because when people come to the laboratory and I measure fat oxidation rates, as well as lactate clearance capacity, this is the exercise intensity, what I've seen over the years, where people improve that the most. But that's not everything. You need to really also stimulate other intensities. And for that, zone two is very important. This is what uh, zone two is the intensity that one uh, most competitions are won. A very, that's the turbo, right? That, that's what an athlete needs, uh, breakaway, uh, to really accelerate, to change pace, and, and, or to sustain a very high effort that is going to make the difference on the road, right? Those are very glycolytic muscle fibers. And um, uh, the bioenergetics is very specific about that glycolysis, and you produce a lot of lactate. So this is why it's important to have good mitochondrial function because that lactate is shuttled from slow, from fast twitch muscle fibers to mitochondrial to mitochondria in in, in slow twitch muscle fibers. So which is the are the ones that are stimulated with zone two. So this is why um, slow twitch muscle fibers are great assistance to fast twitch muscle fibers and the way you stimulate uh, the slow twitch muscle fibers and mitochondria is through zone two this is why but what i have observed over the years in so many different sports but again it's very important to do zone four training or, or lactate threshold or high intensity training and this is what i do with my athletes uh, so cycling season for example has finished and i've been working with uh, three out of the top 10 in the rankings at the end of the year and if you could see how much high intensity exercise they do is is is, is really important uh, workload throughout the year the majority sure is maybe zone two but when they do zone four is the workload is brutal and it's a torture for for some of them right it's really really difficult so it's very important to do that intensity 
uh, and to, to stimulate that because otherwise you're not going to have it. You're going to have a lot of zone two and a great mitotic function, but your turbo is going to disappear. So it's very important to, to, to do this. And I just wanted to uh, uh, describe briefly some of the training zones and how I've been over the years trying to define, uh, not just to call them a name, to call them a name, but just to define what, what that uh, training zone specifically means. Uh, what is the energy system that is stimulated uh, when you train at that zone specifically? And this is how I break down my, my workouts with, uh, with athletes. And, and, and now obviously with people with chronic diseases, people who want to improve their mitochondrial function, metabolic health, as well as longevity through exercise. So, so hopefully that this video was useful and thanks for watching. Thank you.